Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kira Kelly and I'm a, a GP from Ireland and I'm here this afternoon to talk about um, communications between doctors and patients and the special interaction and how I suppose we can get the most from that and why that is important as well for people. I'm not quite sure how to use the buttons, so you'll have to bear with me. No. Okay. Communications between doctors and patients is very possibly the most important aspect of our work, even ahead of other, obviously, technical and medical therapies. Um, when a patient comes into the room and sits down, and I know most of you are patients, but there are obviously some, some doctors here as well. When a patient comes into the room and sits down in front of you, that simple interaction frames the relationship that exists between a doctor and a patient and has all sorts of implications for that relationship and is very important and singular in terms of the therapy and in terms of making it a satisfactory and uh, a therapeutic and indeed a positive outcome for patients. That, that, that communication is key. Um, it's the cornerstone of all our interactions and a good exchange allows both parties to understand where the other person is coming from. It's very important that doctors do bear in mind that patients are not just a disease. And I think sometimes because they're overworked and they're busy, it's very easy to see somebody as a set of symptoms or as a condition. And of course, when you're the person sitting on the other side of that desk and you're experiencing a condition, that's not how it is at all. The doctor-patient relationship ha has evolved. It it's not now what it once was. Um, Previously, in previous generations of doctors and patients, it was very much a paternalistic relationship. And what that means is, is, is that um, a patient would come in, a doctor would tell them what was wrong with them, they'd have made a diagnosis, maybe done some tests, tell them what was good for them, and sort of see them on their way. And, and that is simply not acceptable anymore. Um, patients are not machines in need of repair. They are individuals, they are struggling, they are often fear-filled, um, and they're experiencing a very daunting and difficult set of experiences around their disease, around their illness, and it's very important that doctors are completely cognizant and aware of that, because by being aware of that, the interaction will change between a doctor and a patient. It will become far more uh, beneficial to both if the patient is seen as a whole, if we, if we view a patient in what we describe as a holistic way. Um, doctors need to be aware of what we call the biopsychosocial element of the disease in order to truly meet the needs of the patient and I'm going to exp explain that because I'm going to talk a little bit about not using jargon having just used a big lump of jargon um, the biopsychosocial effective communication requires understanding a patient's needs and attempting to meet them by conveying and receiving information that's, that's very obvious I think but cancer is very complex it isn't just one thing it's not like treating a sore throat or, or a cut knee which is you know, a simple linear sort of a form of treatment treatment for cancer has a long path and there are many aspects to it the bio, the psycho, the social and every patient has an individual set of needs you could see two patients with the exact same condition and they may need to be treated slightly differently. Um, biological. The physical effects of the disease, and, and many of you in this room will be well aware of the physical effects of the disease, and, and they can be quite profound. You can be in pain, you can um, be very fatigued, you can be quite depressed, you can feel anxious. So there, there, there will be physical effects of the disease itself. The physical effects of the treatment are also very important. Um, sometimes the treatment can be very painful. You can be sick. You can feel more fatigue. You can feel just generally unwell or not yourself. There can, of course, be hair loss. There can be disfigurement from treatment. All of those things affect how a person feels about themselves, and it is a kind of a profound effect that comes directly from the treatment. So the side effects of the treatment can often be almost as bad as the the disease condition was itself in the beginning. The psychological effects. The psychological effects can be much different than you might have expected them to be. Patients sometimes feel guilty. They feel guilty that they've let people down. Their children, their families, they've become a burden. They, they carry a, a burden of guilt, which is not something that people would necessarily expect to be the case. Um, there is a, a loss of control and a fear. If you're a grown adult, you don't expect to be powerless or passive in your lives. 
but sometimes that's how it feels when you're going on a cancer journey because you're in a position where you don't feel that you are actually in charge of what's happening anymore and that's very daunting for people. Um, anger is a very typical response for somebody with a diagnosis. Um, why did this happen to me? This, this isn't fair. I, I'm healthy. I, I, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I, I, I run. I eat clean. All of that sort of stuff. People feel very you know, strong kind of amounts of resentment. And fear is always there. Um, Self-esteem can be affected. Self-esteem because of the, 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 the treatment sometimes, because of the disease itself. Um, and self-esteem feeds in and affects your relationships, it affects your sex life, it affects how you feel about yourself, it affects how you interact with other people. And people will often experience mental health issues surrounding their, their diagnosis. This sounds very bleak, I should stop talking I think. Uh, <laughs> we'll get on to hope and stuff in a minute. Um, I should say as well, when I, initially did, <laughs> when I initially did the slides, the first one said bio and then the next one said psycho and I thought I can't have that. Um, <laughs> So social, and of course there are implications socially for people when they're unwell. Financial ones, people feel prejudice. People feel that they are looked at differently within their social circle because they've been sick and that people no longer know how to talk to them. And that's very um, isolating and difficult. And sometimes people feel an inability, this is another, another use of jargon that I shouldn't be doing, but an inability to fill normative social roles. And what that means is sometimes you no longer feel capable due to ill health, but also maybe due to how people look at you or due to the fact that you're sick and you have to take time off work to do what you used to do. You mightn't be able to do the school run anymore. You mightn't feel strong enough to be on the top of your game in your work environment. And those things slightly erode your life and how you feel about yourself. But communication is key to therapy and, that, and that's what we're kind of talking about here today. One of the main jobs for a doctor is identifying a patient's individual needs and addressing them. Personally I think that's the only job for a doctor. I think that's why we're here. If you guys didn't have needs and we weren't filling the role of somehow addressing them, we might as well all go home because that is our only job and doctors do sometimes forget that. Um, it is a job that affords a certain amount of status to people and I think therefore they think that they're quite important. But actually we fill no role whatsoever other than providing society with a group of people involved in healing that society when they are unwell. And when you think of it in that terms, it's quite humbling really, we don't do very much. Um, but communication has to take into account the fears of the patient and also the level of understanding of the patient. Lots of patients come from different backgrounds and some people may have a great understanding when you start talking about stages of cancer and grades of cancer and all that kind of stuff and other people may not know what you're talking about at all. Someone's level of understanding and education or the culture that they come from can really affect how they hear what you're saying and it's very important as a physician to be cognizant of that and always to take that into account. And there are always unknown unknowns. Sometimes I've talked to a patient and I felt that I dealt with all their queries and that they really, you know, got what I was trying to say and all that kind of stuff. And then they'll blindside me with a, with a, a mad question <laughs> that I, I, I would never have predicted. And that's because I can't always know what somebody's worrying about or I can't always know how somebody feels. And that's why communication is key because if you guys tell us how you feel, then we're much better able to help you with that. So there will always be unknown unknowns. The kinds of things that do influence um, how a patient feels, are, these, are, these are a very obvious set, I suppose. Beliefs, values, expectations, culture and personality. We're all made up of those things. Every one of us has a set of beliefs. We have a set of values. We have some expectations from what we'll get from the interaction with our doctor. And obviously people have personality difference and cultural differences and all of that feeds in, which is why every consultation needs to be tailored or at least attempted to be tailored to the individual. And if we do that, we'll have a much better interaction. How do we communicate with each other? Well, we discuss things, so there's I say something, you say something, there's that back and forth, that talking about what we both think. Sometimes there's explanation because there will be things that as a patient you won't really know what it means or the implications or how this is going to go. And so explanation is very important. Um, hearing and asking questions, both the doctor and the patient should be hearing and asking questions. I should be asking questions of my patients about how they feel, what they want, what they understand. But you guys, you, you shouldn't be passive in these things. You have a role here too in asking and getting what you need from the consultation. So that communication needs to be a two-way street to be effective. And it's always important to clarify. If there's something you don't understand, you should be able to ask. And occasionally I've had patients saying to me, well, I did ask, but then he got a bit angry. That's unacceptable. It, it, that's not an acceptable interaction between a doctor and a patient. You should be free to ask 
and to hear and to clarify what you need to know from any individual interaction. And there is always choice. There is always choice in terms of your doctor. There is always choice in terms of your therapy. Ultimately, our role is to lay out your choices to you and then you get to pick what suits you. Um, sometimes you feel you don't have very many choices because we say, oh, this drug is the way to go. But there is always a degree of choice about whether or not you choose to undertake a path of therapy, even if we've recommended it. I've put a big typo in here to see if there's anyone paying attention at this point in the, in, in the, uh, in the talk. And it's nearly finished as well, so, so don't, don't completely lose hope. We will come to hope. Um, the quality of this the doctor-patient relationship contributes to the therapeutic relationship and it plays a significant role in outcome. That's something that physicians love. We love talking about outcomes. We're always talking about statistics. Um, and outcomes can mean somebody gets better. Outcome can mean that somebody lives longer. But outcomes can also mean that somebody is happier and feels better. I think it's important for us to remember that. And a good relationship can actually have a healing and a therapeutic effect on a patient. We've all gone into the room and spoken to a doctor and come out and gone and gone, God, I feel much better, I feel lighter. That's good communication, that's a good interaction. And sometimes we've also gone into a room and come out and felt, oh my God, I feel awful. Sometimes that is because of the news that was conveyed in that consultation, but sometimes it's because of how it was conveyed, and that's why communication is important. <coughs> The real components of a relationship between any person and another person, but particularly, I suppose, between doctors and patients, are trust, and it needs to be mutual, and respect, which also needs to be mutual. Um, trust is key. If you don't trust your doctor, then that makes you feel very insecure in your relationship, and that is not a good place to be. You've enough going on. If you don't feel secure in your relationship with your doctor, that's a problem. But we also need to be able to sort of trust too. And doctors sometimes talk about when the therapeutic relationship is broken down between them and patients. Um, and that does happen occasionally. And sometimes at that point, it's better to actually have a different doctor. Because this is important. It is important that you interact in such a way as you get some benefit from these interactions. It isn't just about imparting information. And I think respect is a foundation stone. If, if there is not respect, and mutual respect, then um, that's become very dysfunctional. The general tools that we should use in communication terms are obviously to listen. Um, there is a great study that shows that doctors on average, I don't even want to say this myself, but we, we wait on average seven seconds before we interrupt a patient. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not good. And when you ask doctors, they usually say, oh, three minutes, five minutes. No, no, it's seven seconds. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and maybe it's because we're all a little bit overworked, but maybe it's because we think we know best. Um, so listening is very important, and we do learn from our patients. Open-ended questions are much better because they allow people to express themselves. So we shouldn't be asking patients questions in a manner in which the answer is yes or no. It shouldn't just be, do you feel this, do you feel that? That's not good. It should be, how do you feel? Because that allows somebody to bring in all the aspects of what they're experiencing. It's really important, in fact, I think it's probably the most important thing, that we focus on the person and on the individual and what they're experiencing, not just on the disease, not just on the march of the disease, because that is dehumanising and objectifies the person in the room. And when you're struggling with things like cancer, I think it's extremely important that you, you still feel heard, you still feel that you aren't just this person walking around carrying cancer in you, that you're still yourselves, that it hasn't taken that dignity from you. So I think really focusing on the individual and the person is key. Um, and understanding other people's points of view. Sometimes people's points of view surprise us as doctors because we, we think we've explained things very clearly and that you understand and you'll want to do what we want you to do. And then you'll say, well, actually, no, that doesn't suit me because I want to go on holidays then or because my daughter is graduating or because I, I don't think I want any more therapy or, 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 or whatever. And, and sometimes we, we, we're sort of blindsided by that. We need to understand the point of view of the person who is experiencing the condition because that's actually all that really matters in this, in this case, no matter what we think, that's actually all that matters. Um, and being critical or judgmental is unhelpful and we should avoid it. And also the use of body language, and it should be appropriate body language. We don't want inappropriate touching, but there is such a thing as appropriate touching in the consultation and I'll just say no more about that. Um, but more importantly and possibly most importantly, empathy and honesty, transparency and hope. Those, those are cornerstones of communication. We are just two humans in a room, often dealing with very difficult and complex issues. And I think that remember that we're just two humans, that, that we're human and you're human, and, and that if you can actually 
mentally walk in someone else's shoes, you have a much greater understanding of what they're experiencing. So empathy is very important for doctors. But also honesty. We don't always know what's going to happen. We don't always know how this is going to play out. And I think being open and honest about that is, is better. It's sometimes better to say, I don't know, and pretend to know because that undermines your credibility. And hope. I, I'm not suggesting anyone should ever be given false hope because that is unhelpful. But I think there is always hope. There is always hope in terms of living longer, surviving better, living better, fighting harder, having good experiences, using your time, all of those kinds of things. We can't always, we can't always um, cure people, but we can make the journey better for people, and I think hope is very important. Um, avoid jargon. I've used loads of it here this afternoon, but avoid it. If you're not me, avoid jargon. Talking. I often think jargon is actually the, 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 the kind of the scope of the younger doctor because they're a bit nervous and they're a bit insecure and they're trying to show off a little bit that they know the big words. It's usually unhelpful. Nobody needs to, to use them. And the most important thing in any interaction is that the other person understands what you're talking about. And big words are often in the way there. Um, Doctors do have expertise, but that does not mean we have to have a hierarchy in the consultation room. And collaboration improves both compliance and satisfaction for patients. I often think compliance is a funny word. It sounds like we're trying to coerce you, but I, maybe we are. But I think it's important to try and keep people on side with you and let them understand that they have some power in the interaction. And it is empowering for doctors as well, because we don't carry the sole burden of thinking we have to do everything for everybody else, that this is, this is a collaborative effort where everyone has a say and where everyone gets to choose. A good relationship benefits us too. It's increased job satisfaction and decreased burnout, so if we get something from that interaction with our patients, it's beneficial to us. Um, and just bear in mind that communication is not always easy. There are complex issues to be discussed and teased out. And sometimes there are dilemmas that there may be different roads we could take and we're not quite sure which is the best one. And it is harder than you might imagine to break bad news to a patient. It is quite, quite challenging. And, and we go through quite a lot of training to do it, and sometimes we still get it wrong. But it is something that sometimes has to be done, and it should be done in a sensitive and an empathic manner, in a way that it is not made any worse by the communication. It should be as made as good as it can be. Um, and different patients will want different things. There are patients who want to know everything. They want to know every detail. And then there are patients who go, I don't want to know it all tell my husband, tell my, my daughter, tell somebody else. I think we have to respect those choices. It, it, you know, everybody feels a little bit differently about how, how they want this to play. Um, and so there's no right or wrong, really. And I think using we and, and sort of expressing sort of solidarity with the patient is important, and also using silence in terms of communication is important. Sometimes it's good to just say something and let it sit so the person has time to absorb and reflect before they react. If we all keep talking all the time, sometimes people are... Um, prevented from actually getting to think through what's being said in the consultation and therefore don't get to ask the questions that they may have liked to have asked. Um, so summary, I am nearly finished. The, the doctor and the patient are both humans and often struggling in a space to discuss difficult things. Um, I think the most important thing is to stay in touch with your humanity, to always go with empathy, to always go with honesty, those things are key. Um, and never think that clinical skills are more important than good communication because they're actually not. Um, and that the doctor is the drug in the room. There's a, a, a doctor called Ballant who's quite famous in medical terms who did lots of work on the consultation and what we should bring to the consultation. And he has always said that the key thing is what you express to the patients and what you hear from the patients. It's all about that and that you can be the most therapeutic thing that the patient experiences ahead of drugs and surgery, that you can get something from that interaction. And if you're not getting that and you're being shortchanged in your interaction, maybe you should think about that and ask why. Um, oh, and use humour. Um, I like this slide very much. Why are there never any good side effects? Just once I'd like to read a medication bottle that says, may cause extreme sexiness. <laughs> I think we'd all like that medicine. Um, so in summary, lastly, talk. Talk to your doctor. Doctors should talk to you. Listen. That should be a two-way street. And learn. We'll all learn from that. Thank you very much.